Ever built a Docker image and thought, now what? How do I get this running in the real world? Well, many developers hit that point and realize that deploying Docker images on production isn't just a copy paste from your local setup. Hello world, my name is Monis and today we will deploy a Docker image on production. We will start by creating a simple Docker image and then walk through the steps of deploying it in a live environment. And along the way, I'll show you a live demo so that you can see everything in action. And if you run into any issues along the way, I have included a troubleshooting guide along with all the code examples from this video in the description. And finally, we will break down the key differences between configuring Docker for production versus local environments. But before we start, if you're new to the concept of Docker, I highly recommend you to watch my other two videos on Docker, which will lay a good foundation for understanding this video. So if you're ready to take your Docker skills to the next level, let's get started. Imagine a very basic application which simply says hello world packed inside a Docker file. If we want to run this on our local system, we can simply create a Docker image by using the docker build command and supplying a name to it. And then we can use the name of the image and run it on our local computer. Alternatively, we can also create a docker compose file and simply run that. But the process of running a docker image on production requires a few extra steps. First, an image is created using the docker build command which would look somewhat like this. In real life scenarios, along with the image name, we also add a tag to the name of the Docker image. This tag can be specified by adding a colon to the name, and then we can add the tag. The tag helps us to manage different versions of the app. We will explore this further in this video. The next step is to push this image to a Docker registry. A Docker registry is a place where you store different versions of your image. When you create an image on your local machine, it resides on your system but the production environment doesn't have access to your system. Therefore, you upload your image to a Docker registry so that your production application can pick the image from there. When you write a Docker file, you specify a base image by using the from statement followed by the image name. This image is pulled from hub.docker.com, which is a public Docker registry. Similarly, you can also get a private registry for your organization from providers like AWS, Azure, Google Cloud, or even Docker Hub. In this video, we will be using Docker Hub to keep things simple. Once the image is successfully pushed to the registry, then we need to deploy it to a server. For this, we will just log on to the server, open the terminal, pull the image and use the docker run command to actually run the image. So let's do all of these steps and see how it works out. The first thing that we must do is to procure a private Docker registry. Docker Hub provides one private repository for free. We just have to create an account on hub.docker.com and we can simply click on create repository. A namespace will be pre-selected and we can set the name of the repository as my personal image and set the visibility to private. Now let's create a Docker image on our computer. It can be easily created by using the docker build command. Here we just tell Docker to build an image using the app.docker file in the current directory. And then we specify the image name and a tag. Although we can name our image anything we want, for production purposes, it must align with the Docker registry. For example, in this case, we specify the namespace from the Docker registry, an image name, which is also our Docker repository name, and a tag separated by colon. A tag is usually used to specify the version of the image. Since this is our first version, we can simply call it version 1. Once this command is successfully executed, the image should have been created on our computer. To validate this, we can use the docker images command, which will list our image and its tag, that is version 1, meaning it has been successfully created. Now the image is ready to be uploaded to the docker registry. But before we do that, we need to authenticate ourselves with the docker login command. This will ask for a username and password. Here we can specify the credentials that we used while creating an account on Docker Hub. Once the login is successful, we can use the docker push command along with our image name and upload this image to the docker registry. Once this command is successful, we can log in to hub.docker.com, click on the repository and check if our image has been uploaded. In our case, we can clearly see the image along with the tag version 1 successfully uploaded. Now, the final step is to actually deploy this image 
to a production server. You can get a server from AWS, Google Cloud, Azure, or any other cloud provider of your choice. If you don't want the hassle of setting up a server, you can also do the following steps on a friend's computer for testing purposes. In this video, we will be using an EC2 server from AWS, which is a simple Linux server. AWS provides a simple way of accessing the terminal of your server using the browser. Alternatively, you can also SSH directly into the server. If you're doing this for the first time, you may have to install Docker service on your production server. It can be easily done by a couple of commands. Details are in the description. Now, from the server terminal, run the docker login command and then provide your docker hub username and password to authenticate. Next, we need to download our image using the docker pull command, which looks like this. To check if our image is successfully downloaded, we can use the docker images command just like we did on our local computer. Next, we just need to run the docker image by using the docker run command, where we specify hyphen d to make sure that it runs in the detached mode that is, in the background. This is important because if you don't specify this and close the current terminal, the Docker container will also shut down. Next is the port forwarding. We are running an application which runs on port 8080 inside the container. We forward the traffic of our server's port 80 to the application's port 8080 so that we can access the app easily from our browser. Once the command is successfully executed, we can go back to our AWS console copy the server's IP address or the public URL and hit it in the browser. And there we go. We can successfully see our Hello World application from a production server on which the Docker image is successfully deployed. Alternatively, we can also use the curl command to see our web page. To summarize, first, we created an image on local with a name that aligns with our Docker repository. We also attached a version to it. Next we uploaded it to our private Docker registry. And finally, we logged into our production server, pulled our image, and ran the image using the docker run command. These sequence of steps are quite simple, but there are a few important things to consider when you are working with real production environments. Firstly, we did all of this process manually. Usually, this process is automated by a deployment pipeline. These deployment pipelines follow the process of continuous integration and continuous delivery. In my next video, I will walk you through how to automate all of this with a deployment pipeline. You may have noticed that in the docker run command that we used, we specified a container name. This argument is optional and if we skip this, docker will generate a random container name for us. However, on production, it can be quite useful to specify a name because it provides a better control over the environment. If we need to stop the container, we can simply do so by using the command docker stop followed by the container name. In addition to this, if we need to deploy a newer version of the image, we can easily stop the container and then remove it by using the docker rm command followed by the container name. This way, we can pull a newer version of the image but still reuse our standardized container name. All these details are present in my public repository. Link is down in the description. This application was quite simple, but for more complex applications, it is possible that you might need to provide some passwords. For example, if this application used a database, you would probably have an application file which would have the username and password of a database to connect to it. If you commit this file in your Git repository, it will be visible to everyone who has access to the repository. In this case, it's a good practice to replace these secrets with environment variables like this. A common industry practice is to set these secrets in a secret manager like AWS SSM and then inject those secrets into environment variables. In real life, you would usually have multiple servers managed by an orchestration engine like Kubernetes, which can be configured to set these environment variables by sourcing the values from a secrets manager like AWS SSM. And on local, these environment variables can simply be sourced from an environment file. If you're familiar with Docker Compose, a common question is whether to use Docker Compose or use regular Docker run command on production environments. Docker Compose is a tool which orchestrates multiple services together. It is quite useful on local machines because it ensures quick development. With one command, it rebuilds and runs all the servers on your machine. In production environments, you might not want to do that. 
If you have a backend and a frontend app, both of their versions and deployments need to be managed separately. In this case, the process that we just saw fits better for production. In a single server app or an app running on your local machine, it is easier to have a look at the logs by using the docker logs command because you have the access to that server. However, in a multi-server production application, it is important to have centralized logging and monitoring systems like Splunk, Graylog, and Datadog so that all your servers can push logs and metrics to this central system. You can then view the logs of all of these servers in one place, thus making it easier for you to debug and look for errors. This is an industry practice to ensure convenience for debugging, as well as keeping the server secure by preventing any server logins to view the logs. To summarize, specifying a container name doesn't matter much on local machines, but on production, it can prove to be useful. Docker Compose is a tool in which you can pack multiple applications together. It is very useful on local systems, whereas on production, each app should be built, pushed, and run separately. Never hard code the secrets. Use environment variables. On local, set the values of those environment variables from a .env file and use it in Docker Compose. You can even commit this file if it is only used on local. On production, Store the secrets in the secrets manager and use the orchestration engine like Kubernetes to populate environment variables from the secrets manager. Logs can be viewed on local system easily by the docker logs command. On production, especially with multiple replicas of the same server, consider using centralized logging like Graylog or Splunk. I hope you are feeling more confident about deploying Docker in a live environment now. And remember, if you run into any issues, check out the troubleshooting guide linked in the description. Next up, we are going to level up by automating this entire deployment process with a CI-CD pipeline. So be sure to stay tuned for that. And if you have any questions or thoughts, drop them in the comments below. See you in the next video. Bis dann.